Hey, John Tyson here. Thanks so much for joining us for our Controversial Jesus series. This series is a response to questions that were emailed in from our congregation about what it means to follow Jesus in a moment and place like ours. So I hope you go ahead and enjoy this talk. If we can answer any questions you have or serve you in any way, please reach out to us, hello at churchofthecity.com, and you can follow along with this series on our podcast or this YouTube channel. Cheers. The uh, teaching text tonight is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. Do not stir up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermins do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening, everybody. How are you? How's your weekend going? My son just turned 18, just graduated from high school. I'm sending him out. I got one more to go. They'll still be on the books forever. But so it's been a long weekend, but I am excited to be able to uh, share and talk through this passage with you. Uh, We are coming to the end of our Controversial Jesus series. Uh, just remember that Jesus, with all of his controversy, ended, being, ended up being crucified on a cross. That's how, that's how it went right there. And uh, so I am like not quite ready to go that far. But uh, we're getting towards the end of it. So next week, we're actually going to close out this uh, series, which has been a 10-week long series. And we're going to start a new series called Teach Us to Pray. So uh, I'm going to talk on the 24th on the topic, if we all know prayer is important, why don't any of us pray? And it is a guilt-free, honest assessment of why we all believe in prayer but don't pray. And I think it's going to be very, very helpful. That's going to launch us into the rest of the summer, talking about adoration, contemplation, and intercession, praying in three directions. So getting a vision of who God is, coming to terms with who we are, and then moving out in praying for others. And all of this, as you know, is pointing towards uh, a full launch for a massively expanded prayer culture in our church and uh, we're actually looking to hire a prayer director to facilitate prayer in our community we are aggressively moving as quickly as god will allow us under the leading of the holy spirit to building out 24 7 prayer here in the city we have a place we have a heart we have a growing team of people towards this and uh, so we're going to spend the summer talking about it many of you know i am going on a worldwide revival tour with my family for vacation So we're going to all the places or many of the places in history that great revivals have happened to just pray there and just ask God to do it again. And then we're coming back ready to launch uh, into a great fall. So lift your eyes up, increase your faith. Good things are coming. 
Also, I have had a long weekend, and if I don't get some sort of encouragement while preaching tonight, I may, I may in fact fall asleep during my own sermon, which would be a first. But I'm always up for something new. So let's jump into this. Tonight we're going to talk about Jesus and Mammon. Now, this talk has been in many ways um, inspired, though some of you may have uh, heard this before or heard some key concepts of this, because the last round of questions we got in the Controversial Jesus series were around the issue of money, wealth, privilege, and the income inequality gap. So a lot of questions like, what, what, what do we do with income inequality? What do we do with the poor? Jesus said we're always going to have them with us. How much emphasis should be placed on the poor? How much money is too much for Christians? What about retirement, according to this verse here? Should we have retirement? And what about Wall Street and the 1%? All of those sorts of things here. So before we jump into this passage, I want to give you my background. I am not a neo-Marxist, believe it or not. Um, I don't think Wall Street and finance are inherently bad. I believe access to free markets have done more to eradicate poverty around the world than perhaps all philanthropy and government aid have done combined. Uh, I don't think that being, for, being poor is virtuous on its own. There's no necessity or ne necessary virtue in being poor. However, I do think that where we are in our cultural moment, the distortion of money and the temptations that come from it may be the central concern when it comes to the issue of discipleship and may be one of the greatest opportunities we have in proclaiming the gospel. So these questions come under what I am just going to call the topic of mammon. Now, a couple of other thoughts here. I have had and do have many wealthy friends, and they are some of the most godly, diligent, thoughtful, Christ-like people I know. I have been poor and have had many poor friends, and some of them have been the greediest, least generous, covetous, envious people I know. I've also had rich friends who've been some of the greediest, least generous, covetous, envious people I know, and poor friends who are some of the most godly, diligent, and thoughtful, compassionate, Christ-like people I know. So my point is this, you can't shove everybody into a box and categorize them. Jesus doesn't quite fit like that. Every person's Response, every person's discipleship, how people live these things out are complex. And so I think it's important to keep in mind as we go through this, rather than looking at others and pointing fingers, that we look inward and ask ourselves the question, what is the Holy Spirit saying to my heart? See, ultimately tonight, I don't want to talk, though at some point it would probably good, uh, do good to talk about a, a Christian view of the economy or something. That's not the point of this talk. Primarily what I want to talk about tonight is your imagination. I want to talk about your vision of life. I want to talk about what it is inside of you that when you think and when you dream and you imagine it all coming together in slow motion like a beautiful symphony and you're getting what you want, I want you to, to ask the question, what is it that you want and how did you come to want it? My goal is that you would interrogate your own imagination tonight about what for you is a life of success and that in so doing that we may in fact not run after the same things as the pagans, the things of the kingdom of God. So four short goals tonight. What is mammon? Where does it come from? Why is it so deadly? And how do the people of God resist it? So are you ready? Let's jump in. What is mammon? Gosh, I wish you were with me all day. It's been a little slow in the house of God. What is mammon? Mammon is the inordinate desire to possess wealth, goods, or objects of ab abstract value with the intention to keep it for oneself far beyond the dictates of basic survival and comfort. It is applied to a marketedly high desire for and pursuit of wealth, status, and power. Greed is similarly an inordinate desire to acquire or possess more than one needs. Money is ubiquitously tempting because it's a kind of umbrella principle covering everything money can buy. It also is, or rather falsely promises to be, a security blanket against change. It apes divine self-sufficiency. So Kreef goes on, Mammon is not desire as such, or even desire for temporal possessions as such, but the immoderate desire for them, for it is natural to man to desire external things as means, but mammon makes them into an ends, into gods, 
And when a creature is made into a god, it becomes a devil. So that's the challenge of what mammon is. And Jesus puts mammon as the primary competitor for the people of God. Jesus critiques a lot of other things. He deals with sexuality. Jesus deals with things like pride. Jesus deals with other forms of idolatry. But Jesus says it's actually mammon that's the ultimate threat. Because mammon sets itself up as a god and promises to meet all of your needs. Douglas Jones puts it this way from his book, Dismissing Jesus. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Jesus didn't deny that money was a god, that God even has a name, mammon. Jesus affirmed mammon as the sole serious competitor to the Trinity. Jesus understood the antithesis or contrast between God's way and mammon's way as the most fundamental distinction in all of life and history. He didn't divide the world into left or right, liberal or conservative, or the envious versus the entrepreneur, or Christian versus Muslim. Jesus didn't make mammon a side temptation for a few like we do. Typical Christians tend to shrink mammon into one of many small idols alongside Aphrodisian sexuality, Hephaestian technology, Bacchanalian passion, Promethean science, Gaian mysticism, the Leviathan state, and others. For Jesus, mammon wasn't one idol among many equals. He singled it out as a direct competitor to God. He never contrasted the idols of sexuality, of knowledge, or the earth in such stark opposition to God. Jesus never said you can't serve sexuality in God or knowledge in God, though they were idols too. So I want, I want us to wrestle with this tension. If this is this thing that Jesus says, look, you can serve God or you can serve mamma, but you cannot serve both. And in fact, a culture of trying to serve both will actually distort and disorder your heart. It says you will love one and hate the other. So this isn't sort of like a neutral juggling thing we do. This is a central issue of the disciple of Jesus' heart. Mammon is a serious threat to those following Jesus. Well, where does mammon come from? What are the roots of mammon? So it won't surprise you to know that mammon is not something that human beings dreamed up in their own hearts. This is actually the plan of the enemy sowed in seed form to them to get them to trust in something other than God. The roots of mammon are found in the garden. Honestly, we, we, we sort of rush past the opening chapters of Genesis because they don't get as much attention uh, in terms of space as a lot of the other parts of Genesis. And so as a result, we assume it lasted for about eight hours and then God moved on with the redemptive history. But I want us to understand and feel the weight of this, that when Adam and Eve were placed by God as image bearers, crowned with glory and with splendor, made a little lower than the angels, but the jewel of all creation... God literally gave them the whole world. Adam and Eve controlled the world. They were the stewards of all of creation. And yet, what does Satan come along and say to them? God's holding out on you. It's like, what is he holding out on? You've got the whole world. The whole world is yours. Satan's like, God's holding. There's something better than this. This is not a rap lyric. The whole world can be yours. This is a serious promise that God has given to his children. And the enemy comes along and says, Don't trust God. You can get it yourself. In fact, he says, if you take what I'm offering you, what you're going to realize is that you can become like God. And when you're a God, you don't need another God. You're independent. And this was the chief lie. Now, Adam and Eve sin, and they step away from the covenant blessing of God. They step out on their own. And as a result of doing so, individuals sin, because there's just a few of them, as it begins to move, as culture advances and accelerates, and it spreads out through the world, individual sin gets mixed together into human society and culture as it forms, and we end up with systemic forms of sin and evil in the world, much as we see it today. And so we see from Adam and Eve's rebellion, this temptation of mammon to possess, to acquire apart from God, to be independent. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what would that look like if it was mapped onto a human personality and onto a city or a culture that worshipped mammon? Well, believe it or not, there's examples of this. The children of Israel wrestle with this. This is part of God's warning for his people as they move in the nations. But every now and then in the prophetic literature, we get these accounts where something happens, where God sends a messenger in to rebuke these leaders. And in one of these accounts in the book of Ezekiel, there's this picture, and it's very, very hard. It's, it's almost like there's an overlap between a human personality and a spiritual power. 
I mean, I don't know if, you, if you, you'd even like tend towards or, or dare to approach the word principality, but mapped onto a human personality is this spirit, and God rebukes the leader, and then God rebukes the fruit of this leader's values. And this is what we read. The word of the Lord came to me is in the book of Ezekiel, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, which has always been my favorite of the biblical stones, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Now listen to this. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say the ruler of Tyre. This is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say. And now we're getting into the internal monologue of mammon. This is the self-talk. This is say to my soul, soul. But this is mammon speaking. In the pride of your heart, you say, I'm a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. By your wisdom and understanding, you've gained wealth for yourself and amassed gold and silver in your treasuries. By your great skill in trading, you've increased your wealth. And because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. Now, very few of us, when we think about principalities or powers or this sort of thing, view principalities as successful commodities traders. But it's trade that's attached to violence and it's trade that results in wealth, but not that... Wealth on its own is bad, but that wealth begins to preach to the heart. And the message of wealth is you don't need God. You've done this yourself. You're a master of the universe. You're a God. You sit among the seas. And many people have experienced that intoxicating pull of gaining financial success and the luxury, the status, the power that's associated with it. And something in your heart says, I'm special. I deserve to be treated differently. And we say things like this, do you know who I am? Maybe not outwardly, but the inner monologue shifts from a monologue of self to a monologue of mammon. So this then, I, I only highlight this to say that the original lie that's led the human race into misery is the same lie that can get mapped onto leaders and then mapped onto cities and regions. And then that makes, that makes me ask the question today, what sort of leadership do we have and what sort of city do we live in? You see, in many other areas, we like to talk about multi-generational considerations for justice. So, for example, the African-American community today will say, you can't just start now. You've got to go back in time to see how we got here. You may not be personally guilty, but we are all responsible. There's a shared history that's brought us to this moment. The same thing happens with international relations, our relationships with other countries. And the problem, this is not a judgment here because I am the parent, a proud parent of two generation Zs, just skip the millennials, just went Gen X to Gen Z, just keep those letters happening. But my kids don't think that anything happened before they were born. <laughs> they are ahistorical. And so they think that they were born holding a smartphone and this is where life began. And it actually takes tremendous work to help them see the multi-generational narrative that has existed, that has shaped them and brought us to this moment where these giant tectonic plates of power and story and narrative have worked together to make them the kinds of people they are today. And so this makes me say, where are we and where is our leadership taking us? And I think it's safe to say that America, late modern America, may be the most mammon-infested culture in a long, long time time. So if that's mammon, then I want to talk about mammon overconsumption and the temptations to have our vision stolen for us and our imaginations taken captive by our culture that exists today. So I want to do this quickly, but I want to just start back where I think mammon as we experience it today was birthed. 
And I think culturally, on scale, it was birthed around the time of the Great Depression. Now, this famous image here, this is the, the famous trader who lost everything and is wanting $100 for this car. The Great Depression shocked a generation. It was a shared cultural trauma felt across the board that captured an entire nation's understanding of itself and shared narrative. And in many, many ways, what happened was there was a fundamental shift in how people thought about wealth, they thought about security, and they thought about provision. And if I could sum it up in one word, it would be this, thrift. There was a scarcity mentality. There was a desire to save. There was a, a, a fear of running out of goods. So there was tremendous concern, fiscally conservative people trying to stretch their resources in case something like the Great Depression ever happened again. Now, children raised in homes that experienced the negative consequences of the Great Depression were homes, and maybe this was your uh, grandparents or, or your parents, uh, depending on how old you were. This is families who were raised to be incredibly thrifty, very, very thoughtful, very, very conservative when it came to money, never wasting anything, always making sure that you saved a little bit for another day. And so that generation was a generation that rose up with a shared consciousness when it came to the issue of money and the national story of being careful, being thoughtful, being thrifty. Now, those, when World War II loomed on the horizon and eventually when the United States was drawn into war, something shifted because those thrifty kids went off to war. Now, when they went off to war, America's infrastructure, which was surging along and making its way uh, to, to produce more and more goods and services for the United States, when men went off to war, these thrifty men went off to war, many of their wives, who had, who had never really worked outside of the home, were drawn into the workforce for the first time. And this produced major a change in our culture, particularly around the idea of the family structure by getting women to work in our factories. And there was this sense, if the boys are over there fighting, we're going to do something to help them out as well. So women began to work in factories and all of the factories that were producing consumer goods and industrial services were converted to the production of weapons for the war effort. Women were getting paid, making money. American homes experienced dual income families. Uh, for the first time, and this changed the horizon of possibility for women. So after World War II, women weren't going home just to have babies again on their own. There was at least this horizon of possibility that they could work again. Now, America uh, develops military technologies that, that we basically win the race to atomic weapons, and we drop the bombs. So this is what happened to Nagasaki. We drop the bomb. Next slide here. I think this is actually uh, Hiroshima. Just absolutely devastated the city. People just, just gone in the blink of an eye. Cities devastated. How long is it going to take to rebuild that city before it can be productive again? Next slide here. This is downtown London. Again, major cities in Europe bombed out, strained infrastructure, factories destroyed, common life completely disrupted. Next slide here. Again, this is downtown London. If you walk around London today, there's, there's some parts of London you're like, why on earth are those buildings there? They don't quite fit into the architecture of the area. And it's like, these are places that were rebuilt after the war as they're bombed out. Now, when Americans came back from war, while Europe was, re uh, was rebuilding, even though America very generously put the Marshall Plan into place and helped to rebuild when they came back from war. You know, this took place just down the street here, folks. You're probably going to walk past where this kiss happened. And what did, what did they do when they came back? Had babies. In fact, what, what are you doing when your generation is named the baby boomers? It's like, what are you doing, man? I am booming with babies, baby. <laughs> the baby boomer generation. This becomes the largest generation in American history up to that time. Now there is a tension, there is a moment right now. I see, America didn't have any of the... the uh, the, the fighting take place on our soil. And so our infrastructure, which had been geared up to produce weapons, our economic system, our factories, our workforce was prepared, and there was no way America was going to shut all of that down and pretend the war didn't happen. We had emerged on the global scene as a military superpower, 
And now was America's chance to overtake, to leapfrog the rest of the world and become an economic superpower too. So in order to keep this engine running, to convert all of the war effort towards consumer products, economists came together and then Victor Labau has this famous statement about the conscious philosophical shift in American understanding about the economy, where he says our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, replaced, and discarded at an ever-accelerating rate. So again, American narrative, Great Depression, incredibly thrifty and conservative. How do you shake and change a generation's story that's been raised in that? And so we get what Jonas Sachs describes as the rise of the story wars. There was a conscious partnership between media and advertising and economists to turn the American economy into something it had never been, a means to an end for itself. So rise of the story wars. Stories are a particular type of human communication designed to persuade an audience of a storyteller's worldview. The storyteller does this by placing characters, real or fictional, onto a stage and showing what happens to these characters over a period of time. Each character pursues some type of goal in accordance with his or her values, facing difficulty along the way and either succeeds or fails according to the storyteller's view of how the world works. So the goal then was to shift the narrative, to change the setting and the context and the trials and the heroes to shift a cultural narrative towards overconsumption. So a story is asking four questions. Why are we here? What's gone wrong? What will fix things? And how will it look like when it's fixed? And this in many ways was the birth of the modern advertising industry. Now, I've talked about... Uh, the rise of PR before, but just a quick refresher here. Modern PR was birthed by Sigmund Freud's nephew, and he spent time with his incredibly psychologically astute uncle, asking him about the traits of human personality and how to understand human personality. And then he moved into public relations and took all the insights of personal psychological change and pulled it over the American people's eyes through mass PR. And if you read his books and his understanding, it is like personal psychology at a cultural level that was so effective, we don't even have time to go into it tonight. But that shift in manipulating the public combined with the rise of the story wars ultimately led to much of what happens on Madison Avenue and we get the birth of the advertising industry. And this is obviously illustrated best in the show Mad Men. Now, widely recognized as the greatest TV show that's ever been produced. <laughs> universally recognized that those who hated the slow character development lacked any sort of cultural appreciation or sophistication. Mad Men told very skillfully the story of manipulating the consumer's mind to make this conversion, the ego conversion, the ritual conversion, the spiritual conversion from religion and family and nation to goods, incredibly successful. But in order to do this, they still had to overcome some general cultural obstacles. So if, for example, you take Maslow's hierarchy of need, next slide here, Next slide. That's this hierarchy of need. Very, very simple. Uh, physiological needs, safety needs, belongingness and love needs and esteem needs, and then self-actualization needs. Now, at the time, the United States had leapt forward culturally and was experiencing at a popular level, not for everybody, but for most, the highest standard of living that human beings had ever experienced in all of recorded human history. It was a pretty good time for the United States. Next slide. Actually, this is an updated version of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that perhaps people thought would be appropriate. But next, next slide here. Um, so at the time that the story wars begin to rise, this is where Americans were living. We had food, warmth, and rest like we never had before. We had security and safety. We had just defeated our enemies and proved that we were not 
to be trifled with. There was a sense of belongingness and love needs. There was friendships and relationships, people coming home from the wars, loves reuniting, families were being built, babies were booming. And there was this feeling of accomplishment. We had pulled together. Our little ragtag nation had overcome the power and might of the Third Reich and its allies. And so now we were positioned to achieve our full potential. Now, the problem when you're busy self-actualizing is that you don't really need all of these other things. So how can you get people like this to be turned into passive, mindless consumers? Well, this then led to the rise of what was called the inadequacy approach in advertising. The inadequacy approach was designed to play on fear, greed, and vanity to move minds and messages. In essence, next slide here, even though we were actually at the position to self-actualize as a culture, all of the advertising tricked us into believing that our chief concerns were food and water and warmth and rest and sex and basic human needs. And so the inadequacy approach began to shift the way that marketing messages were moved. Along with this shift in how advertising went to the typical American, two other tactics were deployed. One was called planned obsolescence. And so manufacturers got together to ask the question, how do we build goods? That we, how do we shorten the lifespan of commercial goods that we create? But we don't, and we've got to find this tension because if we make them last too long, people won't need to buy new ones. And that's going to mess up our vision. But if they break too soon, people will be angry and they won't rebuy our products. So after a period of incredible testing, they got it to where you would go out, buy something. After a period of time, it would break. And you'd feel like, I got my money's worth. And you'd turn right back around and happily buy the exact same product. By the way, something IKEA never managed to quite get right. If you work at Ikea, I bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless you. <laughs> Planned obsolescence. Now, to just give you one current example, how many of you have ever bought a long-lasting light bulb for the environment and stuff because our story shifted? We could have made those any time we wanted, but we didn't. Why? Because if you make a light bulb that lasts seven years, people won't buy them every two months. Now, if planned obsolescence didn't work, perceived obsolescence came in, and this was all about trends. This was about moving people forward through a desire to fit in, to, to culturally accommodate. I've shared the story of my father. My father, when he was in college, worked at a very high-end men's store called Fletcher Jones. And Fletcher Jones just made clothes that lasted something like 100 years. If I wanted to, in fact, this could be a Fletcher Jones jacket that my father gave me. My father's 70. It's not, but it could be. And so my father just had these clothes, and he just wore the same clothes my entire life growing up. And because they couldn't get in with planned obsolescence because they made such quality clothes, they pushed people into trends and trends chasing, wanting to be in this year's look. And so there was times when I was younger that my dad would be an absolute fashion icon. He'd be walking around and people were like, how is your dad pulling that off? You're the dork, Tyson. Your dad's the man. And then two years later, they'd be like, your dad is a loser. What is he thinking wearing these clothes? My dad just rode the wave of cultural opinion and it would just, <laughs> just rode it out. He was happy to be a winner some days and a loser others. <laughs> but perceived obsolescence is powerful. Now, all of these things coming together, the inadequacy approach, the rise of modern advertising, planned obsolescence, perceived obsolescence, found their home in the rise of mass media. And we forget about this. I remember growing up, and there was three or four channels. And I remember waking up on a Saturday morning. Some of you were like, how old are you? <laughs> but I remember waking up on a Saturday morning, and there was no content. There was just this, like, this is nothing. There's nothing on TV. And I'd be sitting there eating cereal with my sister, like waiting till it was six o'clock. And the cartoons would come on, and you'd be like, heck yes, now I can get on and properly. Because there was just nothing. Mad imagine that. But here's where it was powerful. Everybody basically got the same sources of information. So the ability to disciple or to recruit the imagination through a few channels was very, very strong. And into that rhythm, advertising began to put its way in. As TV shows came out, that gave us a sense of shared identity. A new cultural rhythm arrived. Work, watch, spend, repeat. 
Now, you know this if you've worked in advertising, that advertisers talk about two categories. One category is content, the other category is what's called the filler. Now, when we watch television, we're like, oh, the show, the amazing, compelling narrative, that's the content and the ads are the filler. But if you work in advertising, you know it's actually the reverse. The content is the filler that you come up with so you can carefully place the advertising. That is the content. And so a new American rhythm began. Work, come home tired, sit in front of the box, watch, and then on the weekends go to the mall and then spend and then repeat. Work, watch, spend, repeat. Work, watch, spend, repeat. Now, a couple of other questions I got in the Controversial Jesus series. One question I got was, are we in the end times and how will we recognize the mark of the beast? Well, I've got uh, good news for you. I've discovered the mark of the beast, of the beast to warn you against it. This is the mark of the beast, folks. <laughs> no. I know that Pinterest had a great year last year. Congratulations. If you work there, I bless you too. Um, <laughs> Pinterest basically makes mammon boards. What else are they? What else are they? What else are they? They're just these boards where you scour the internet for the life you wished you have, the person you wished you could be, the color palette in the house, the luxury you wish you could have. And you have the mammon board that you worship at several times a day. Some people stop and read the scriptures, others visit the mammon board to cultivate their imaginations. If this is your first Sunday, thank you. I hope you enjoyed your only time at Church of the City here in New York. I'm sort of kidding. Okay. Now, moving on from something like this to something perhaps that we use every day. Let's just talk about for a second, so the rise of advertising. Ads are everywhere now. Like you knew this about Facebook, didn't you? You got into Facebook and targeted advertising seemed to sort of work where more and people sort of got like over that or whatever. But then they resulted in a lot of people moving over to Instagram. Now the beauty of Instagram, this was no ads. Do you remember that? Some of you are like, what? There was a time when there was no ads? Yeah, there was this actual time where there was no ads at Instagram. And then Facebook bought Instagram. They bought that. And I remember so consciously, like all the rumors in my little world was like, yo, man, I think they're going to start putting ads in Instagram. Like, they'd never do that. Never going to go for that. And I remember when it said, ads are coming. And at first, it was like one ad for every 26, 27,000 images that you saw. And now it's every three or four because they've just woven you into it. And I remember at first, I'd click on the ad and I'd say, hide this ad or this ad doesn't represent me or whatever. And then I went into the settings and I was like, don't track me. Don't build a profile of me. Get that pixel out of my computer. I was like all into it. And so I turned off the do not customize my ads. And then I found myself in the middle, I don't know how, of a baby formula milk feeding campaign to take on breastfeeding in my feet. I have no idea. I don't know if my wife grabbed my phone. I don't know what was happening, okay? But this is where I found myself. And I was so tempted to put back on target ads for me. <laughs> but I didn't. But then I stopped caring and I just got used to it. Now, here's why this is important, okay? Because it's about formation. Now we're so discipled and used to our stories being filled with ads. And the stories are not ads out there on a screen. They're inserted into our narratives. And each little ad says, your story freaking sucks. If you just went here or bought this or, or all the other hundreds of stupid, insane things, your life and your story would be so much better. Look, I've got a confession. Once I got sucked into a story and it talked about how to boil eggs without the shell. And I found myself in some wormhole and the production outlets of factories in China with these little egg things. And uh, I, I was so excited about them, I screen captured it and sent it to my daughter. And it's like, this is going to be a father daughter night where we can like boil eggs without the shell, solving this major problem at breakfast in our home. And they took about two months to come in and when they came in they didn't work. <laughs> Ads are everywhere. We say that children should not have access to unlimited pornography on their phones so they should have filters. But where's the mammon filter? 
for teenagers, where their imaginations are not recruited, where the real life that matters is life apart from God. And it's a life of success, and it's a life of luxury, and it's a life of self-achievement. It's the lie of the garden. It's the lie of Tyre. And it's the lie that is fundamentally baked into our own stories as we tell them through carefully crafted advertising to make you feel inadequate about your actual life in the world. Typical American today sees more ads in one year than a person living 50 years ago saw in their entire lifetime. We just have to ask the question, how is that forming our imagination about what matters in life? And so Jonas Sachs says this, the Puritan values of thrift and modesty were smashed, abandoned for easy consumer credit, conspicuous consumption, and deep personal relationships with brands. In terms of epoch marking changes, this has been as profound a shift as the atom bomb. And so here's the point I've been trying to make through all of this cultural commentary, it's this, is that mammon through multiple generations has woven itself into the narratives and into the institutions and into the structures and into the daily practices that have formed us into people who think the good life is a life of luxury and privilege and success and power and wealth and luxury apart from God. That's the challenge we face. So I want to say that if we're going to become followers of Jesus, if we're going to bear witness to his rule and reign in the world, how we utilize money and how we resist mammon may be one of the defining marks of our discipleship. So I've said what mammon is. I talked about how we got here. Number three, why is mammon so deadly? Three quick reasons. Number one, it leads us away from God. To follow mammon, and you'll notice Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he uses language of pursuit, passionate language. And he says, don't run after these things that the pagans run after. And so he says that what you're after, number one, he's, he's got an assumption that you've got a vision that you're pursuing. So it's not passivity. But he says there's a very, very clear vision. One leads you into the fullness of the life of God, and one leads you away from God. 1 Timothy 6 Paul again uses similar language. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from what? The faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now just a reminder, Ephesus was a banking center, not unlike the city that we live in. And Paul would have said to these people, I've seen what happens when people fall into the financial culture of the cult of Artemis. So you've got to be on guard against that. Jesus, the seed falling among the thorns, refers to someone who hears the word. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word and they make it unfruitful. When I first came to the United States, I, uh, I had a scholarship to study theology. And I was just I was so, I couldn't believe this. I was a high school dropout from a meat factory in one of Australia's uh, notorious neighborhoods for multi generational poverty called Elizabeth South. Lovely place to be from. And when I came to America, I just couldn't believe it. To whom much is given, much is required. And I got lumped uh, one summer between my freshman year and my sophomore year with the other international misfits who had nowhere to go for the summer. So I was given this incredible, incredible job of working the grounds crew. That means that for eight hours plus a day in the sweltering, satanic Georgia heat, I was walking behind a giant lawnmower cutting grass. Now, I, was, I can't remember exactly. I, it was either, I was making either four eighty-five an hour at 20 or five fifteen. I can't remember, but I just know that after I got paid, and after I brought the carbs I needed to exist in this cruel world, <laughs> I had very little money left. And the money I did have left went to this thing, crazy concept, uh, called long distance phone calls. And there was this time where you had to buy a card and pay for every minute long distance that you took. Now, I'd gotten engaged to this incredible girl named Christy Keep. And uh, so... I was just, you know, all of my money was going basically on to pasta and long-distance phone calls. 
Now, they put us international students into this trailer. So I'm living in a trailer, in a, in a trailer park area on a clearing on this campus. And there's other international students in there. And one of the students was from the former Soviet Union. And he too had received a scholarship and was there studying. Now, at the start of the summer, we'd both joke as sort of cultural outsiders. And he was the only Russian anyone had ever met. And I was the only Australian anyone had ever met. And everywhere we went, we were like minor celebrities. And it was actually quite nice. <laughs> but as the summer went on, I, he got sucked into this multi-level marketing scheme and he just changed. And I'd come home and he'd say, John, I, need to, I want to meet with you. I'm like, what do you want to talk about? He's got, I've got a very important opportunity I'd like to talk to you about. And I'd say, look, bro, look, opportunity number one, very important opportunity number one. I'm studying theology in America and it's amazing. So I've got this theological opportunity. Number two, man, I'm trying to lock it down with Christy Keat. That's major opportunity number two. And I'm trying to close that deal by the end of the summer here. So I got a God opportunity and a woman opportunity. I got no more room for important opportunities. I'm good. But he would not give up every time. I want to talk to you about an important opportunity. And I just watched his whole vision shift from this vision of studying theology and serving God to becoming a winner in American culture. And so one day I just felt like I had the biblical responsibilities of brother in Christ to sit him down and just say, hey, look, man, we, we're both here on the grace of God. We're both here in this amazing place studying theology. But it just seems like your vision's been taken over by this desire just like to, to make money. And he said, look, it's easy for you to say, you don't know where I come from. You don't know what it's like to grow up in a culture haunted by the brutality of communism, where personal, personal efforts never rewarded. And there's just poverty and there's no opportunity. I come here and I look at what's available to me and I have to go after this. And I was like, look, man, I respect that. But you can't make the whole reason you came here to become diamond in some multi-level marketing organization, man. If you chase this all the way down, you're going to end up with a different vision for life. Now, as I reflect on that, that's not just something that happened to him. That's the, that, that invitation, that recruitment of our vision, that seduction of our imagination happens daily in our lives. And if we follow it, we're going to wake up and we're not going to know how it's happened. But two years from now, we're going to be so far from Jesus we may barely discern the pathway back as a prodigal. Mammon is dangerous because it leads us away from God. Also, if you work in a multi-level marketing company, I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, number two. Why is mammon so deadly? Because it's based on pride. This is, this is part of the root. One of the things as you begin to study and become familiar with the whole arc of Scripture, one of the things that you see is this cycle. God loves to bless people, and this includes financial prosperity. And number two, every time he's getting ready to bless them, he just rolls out the warning sheet of what blessings will do if they're not careful. And you almost see this tension. God's like, I want to bless you because this is in my heart, but be careful of my blessings because they could become a substitute for my heart. But because I love you so much, I'm going to bless you anyway because it's in my nature. But be careful. I want to give you an example of this. This is from the book of Deuteronomy for the children of Israel as they're getting ready to inherit all God has for them. Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 6. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. And a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey. It's like there's an Italy in the promised land. A land where bread will not be scarce. You will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. So again, God's like, there is raw commodities for you to harvest, to get ahead, to build. This is your opportunity. However, verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied... Praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you, but be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you to this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud 
And you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you, with water, he brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you the manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. Now you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands has produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Now, I noticed in all of these warning passages, there's a cycle that goes something like this. Failure to praise God for his blessings. If you just praise God for what he does for you, you will not enter into this cycle but many people get caught up in the moment and they forget to locate the source. And when you forget to praise God, you forget to remember God. And when you forget to remember God, you forget to observe his commands. And when that happens, you become susceptible to pride because you forget about God and you forget about his ways and you forget about his commands. And you're like, I think I just sort of did this myself with my hard work. And then again, this creates a further cycle of forgetfulness, which leads to deception, which ultimately leads to judgment. But isn't this true how this goes? Maybe you've experienced this. Like your parents are like, don't let the city corrupt you. And then you come here and you're like, nah, man, I'm locked in. I found a great church. I'm in a small group over the course of time. You finally get, remember that first year you got that bonus? Remember that? Remember three years later where you couldn't believe how small that first year bonus was? And you're just like, this is unreal. And you're like, no, of course, of course, God, of course, God but also my 90-hour weeks and also my wicked hard research and also my people skills to navigate the politics and also I'm awesome. So <laughs> also pride. And then it fills your heart and then you start running after the things of the pagans and then you wake up. Pride creeps into our hearts. Mammon leads us away from God. Mammon pushes pride into us, which ultimately results in the discipline of God. And then mammon destroys compassion within us. 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Now, this idea, not having pity in the Greek means to cleanse the heart to close the heart. Now look, this is not like when you see global injustice, when you see total uh, multinational income disparity. It just says you see a brother or sister in need around you, something you can do something about. When you see someone, you're like, nah. When you close the heart, how can the love of God be in you? Because what's Jesus' response when he sees people? Opens his heart. The instinct of Jesus when he sees those in need is always to open the heart, never to close it. But mammon gets us to self-preserve with a scarcity mindset, a mindset of pride, a mindset that doesn't care about others, and we see need and we close the heart. It says, if you close your heart, you're not imitating Jesus, you're imitating Satan. Don't do that. We have to have pity. And mammon will destroy our compassion for others. Not my people, not my problem. That is not the heart of God. So if... Jesus is, is warning against, against mammon because it will lead us away from him and it will fill our life with heartache and it's going to fill us with pride and bring us under the discipline of God and it's going to destroy our hearts and compassion for others. What's the antidote to mammon? Well, thank you for asking. Two quick things in reply. Number one is we have to cult cultivate just like this deep sense of gratitude and contentment for what God's given us. Listen to this verse, this is Hebrews, th Hebrews 13. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord's my helper, I won't be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Many of us spend so little time really meditating on and contemplating what God has done for us in Jesus. It's amazing. You can find people with PhDs in economics but when it comes to their soul, you ask them, who are you in Jesus? And they're like, I don't know, man. It's like elementary school. 
And it would, it would be my heart's desire that everybody has a PhD in their self-understanding of what it means to be united with Jesus Christ. We need spiritual genius, theological depth to say, do you know what I have in Jesus? It's extraordinary. So I wrote a very short book. Most of you have been given a copy or some of you bought it, bless you. And it's a book called The Burden is Light. And in one chapter, I, I just have like a little thing on your identity in Jesus. And so there's like just like a list of like, in Jesus I am or whatever. But there was a little dispute with the publisher when I was writing that chapter because I just had this mega list. And I was just trying to literally assault the, the senses so you'd be reading this, you'd be overwhelmed with everything you have in Jesus. And they're like, you can't have that much in Christ text in this chapter. I was like, why not? There's like, well, there's just so many reasons why you can't do that. And so I had to limit with a brief overview this restricted 30-point account of what we have in Jesus. But not tonight. <laughs> not tonight. Not at the Church of the City in Times Square. Every three or four months, I try to throw this up just so we get it. So let's just have a little look here. In Jesus Christ, I'm faithful. I'm God's child. I'm justified. I'm Christ's friend. I belong to God. I'm a member of Christ's body. I'm assured all things work. Through. Next slide. We didn't even have time to go through this. Next slide. We didn't even have time to go. Next slide. We didn't even have time to go to this. We're not even getting close. Look, man, let me tell you something. A luxury watch is not going to improve your life. The iPhone 11 is not going to fix your life. The two-bedroom, two-bathroom on the street that you want is not going to fundamentally alter your eternal existence. You've got every spiritual blessing. And so we can push off this seductive spirit of mammon that says there's more apart from God than with God when you figure out what you've got. Have you ever, ever had someone in your family die and they're wealthy? And something your heart's like, dear God, I hope they wrote me into the will. And the lawyers all, in a godly way, in a godly way. <laughs> and then everyone comes together and they're sort of reading out who gets what. And can you imagine if your uncle was a billionaire and you were his favorite? And you get a letter where your uncle just says, trust me, you want to be there for the reading. You're like, honestly, I can't, man. I'm just, they've got a new uh, AR thing on the phone and I've got locked into this league with my friends on the internet and uh, I'm just not going to be able to get around to it. And you never show up to hear what you've been left. That's how most people are with their spiritual inheritance. Every now and then we need to just gather around the will and be like, read it again. Read it again. That's so good. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. We need this. We need to cultivate gratitude in our hearts. And then this will then lead us with an awareness of the unlimited supply and resources that we have in Jesus to become generous and rightly order and steward the resources God has given us. 1 Timothy 6, command them to be good, to be rich in good deeds, generous and willing to share. Kent Hughes says this, and I love this. He says, every time I give, I declare that money does not control me. Perpetual generosity is a perpetual de-deification of money. So why do we say the generosity liturgy every week? Because in some sense, it is a pushback against the spirit and scripts of mammon, which recruit us every single day. And at least we have a declarative moment as a community where once a week we're like, not me. Not me. Different story, different script, different pursuit. I got, this, uh, I got this group me from our small group leaders thing. I'm just going to read it to you. Got this between services. One story coming from our community relevant to the talk today. A member of our group has been going through an incredibly tough time, personally and career-wise, including the loss of a job. The community has rallied around this person, including two others who have offered to host them each for one month free rent so they can get back on their feet, praying for, giving mo uh, meals, caring for, and they barely know this sister. Firmly believing that the generosity liturgy has done wonders in shaping our hearts and building an acts like community. Now, let me ask you a question. Who else in the city shows generosity like that? Jesus' people do that. 
This is an alternative story. One of my favorite quotes is from Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary in India and then was serving there for, for a very long time. And when he came back to England, he was shocked to realize that Western culture itself had become a mission field. And he thought he went with this good news from a Christian nation to reach the heathens and came back and realized the heathen were in his nation. And he has this phrase because his point was people don't really, people don't want to hear the gospel. No one's like, hey, how's it going this week? And really good because of the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It just doesn't flow. But he says this quote, we must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. So the way of Jesus in the kingdom of God must be so distinct that people say, why are you living like that? And then we say, thank you for asking. Have you heard about the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? It then gives us the chance to talk about the good news of Jesus. So one way we do that, which gets to how do we live when God blesses us with wealth, is a very simple concept. But I like this concept. It's just the concept of radical class distinction. And it simply means this, that... All of us will end up over the course of the time. You know this. Most of you will be financially successful. If you've, if you've had the, the chutzpah to come to New York and deal with all that brain damage to get you here, <laughs> most of you, if you hang around, will become successful. And those of you who are from here have figured out the hustle a long, long time ago. So the question is, what do you do when you arrive at that place of success? Well, you're going to be tempted to put on these cultural markers, these outward symbols of success. It will be wealth signaling for those around you. Certain brands, certain luxury items where people go, way to go, you've made it to this club. But when you consciously choose not to when people know that you could, and those status symbols in many ways enable you to belong, and people say, hey, I know you can do this, why aren't you doing this? They're going to say, why are you living like this? At which point you'll get to say, have you heard about Jesus? So radical class distinction. Now listen, don't look at the people above you and judge them. Look at your life right now and ask in your current class, how can you live differently in such a way that people go, why are you doing that? Now Andy Crouch once sensed this, to become a radical culture in this country is quite easy. All you have to do is give 10% of your money and turn the television off. That's what the Mormons have done, and they punch way above their weight. <laughs> Radical class distinction. So I ask you seriously, what would that look like for you? Just not, not like when you're killing it later on, but right now, because if you don't get the principle right now, you don't develop the instincts right now, you won't be able to resist later on because those environments are intoxicating. So the formation process right now what does radical class distinction look like for you? Another idea, perhaps, around generosity is secret giving. I love this. Derrida has a whole concept on the gift, and it's absolutely a staggering concept. He says, the problem with giving in most modern cultures, it by default, you're trying to bless someone, and it creates a cycle of obligation. You ever experienced this? Someone takes you out for dinner, and you're like, dang it, I have to have them out for dinner again. You can't just say, thanks, I'll never see you again. I appreciate that generosity. I'm out. No, no, no. Hey, let's get together. No, let me return that. You know, it's always like that. So he says, the best gift is a gift where nothing is giving, nothing is received, and nobody knows who did what. Now, how do you break this cycle of giver, gift, and recipient that tends to create a power cycle or an obligation cycle? You have to break the equation. And one way you break the equation is you just remove knowledge of the giver so there's a gift and a recipient, but nobody to make the claim of obligation. And when Christians do that, we usher in. This is Jesus taught this on the Sermon on the Mount. We usher in our response. We're the only person you can thank is God. You ever experienced this? I've been on the receiving end of so much secret generosity. It's so frustrating and it's amazing. Because I've gone... Um, at other parts of the world, they have these things called letterboxes where you walk on this, basically a road, and at the end of it, there's this little box where they put your mail in, and you take your mail of it and you walk back, and it's, called, it's, it's paper mail. People send this to you. So I remember many times before I moved to New York, walking down the road and opening, and there'd be a letter with, with money in it, and it would just say, you're loved, bless your family or something. And I'd, I'd just be like, I need to write a thank you, go thank you God 
thank you. The cycle was broken. Now, when Christians do secret generosity, something formative happens in us, and glory goes to God for the gift in the world. And secret generosity is an opportunity. You learn to practice it now, and you have no idea the kind of good you'll unleash in the world later. Folks, we're officially out of time. I've been preaching for quite some time now. Let's wrap this thing up. Implications. By the way, pastors around the world ask me, how do you get your people to let you preach that long, man? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I just keep talking. They either walk out or they stay. That's kind of how it happens. Luke 12. Implications. Then he said to them, this is Jesus now, watch out, be on your guard against all kind of greed because life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So what I would love all of us to do, just by way of application, is to, just to honestly just interrogate our own motives, to discern and deconstruct the stories that have made the way into our hearts. In reading The Snowball uh, Effect or The Snowball, which is a Warren Buffett story about Warren Buffett's life, who at one point was the richest man in the world. I remember reading this chapter, being so moved by it, because it's where Warren Buffett says he got the vision to be the richest man in the world. And he was a fascinating kid, very sharp mind, uh, different than most of his friends. But his dad, who worked in finance in some level, came to New York to deal with some clients. And they were eating at a nice restaurant uh, downtown. And his dad's clients were sitting there, and he's, you know, he just tagged along to be with his dad. And a guy came around to their table with a tray of tobacco leaves. And one of the guys who was having lunch with Warren Buffett's dad individually pointed out the leaves he wanted. He wanted, and then the guy rolled a custom cigar at the table and then gave it to this guy and lit it for him. And Warren Buffett, as a, as a middle school kid, late elementary school kid, said, whatever life gets you that, that's the life I want. I will be the richest man in the world. The vision of mammon made its way into his heart when he was 10 or so. So can I just ask you, have you ever interrogated your vision of life? I remember just a couple of years ago in our church, we had a crisis because I would just ask people, what's your life vision? And you know what the number one vision for people in their 20s was? I want to make $5 million, bank it, live off the interest, marry, settle down, leave the city. That's it. I just remember thinking, in what way is that different than the pagans? There should be, there should be something in us that has a countercultural angst against the way of the world. So have you ever really asked that? What's formed my vision? Have you ever like got in touch, asked the Holy Spirit, not just to search you for sin, but to search your imagination for its formation? What things have made their way in? What conversations with my parents? What relationships have I been in? What experiences of either bliss or embarrassment have shaped my understanding about what my life should be? And has any of that been formed by a spirit of mammon? And then to ask the Holy Spirit, God, please help me to imagine what my life looks like, blessed and stewarded under your care for your kingdom and your glory. Renew my imagination. Increase my vision, God, for your kingdom. We have to discern and deconstruct the stories in our hearts. The story of mammon, why are we here? Pleasure. What's gone wrong? Lack. What will fix things? More. And how will it look like then? Luxury and success. But the kingdom story, why are we here? We're here for God. What's gone wrong? Sin, disordered loves, disordered de desires. What's going to fix things? Jesus. And what will it look like then? The restoration of all things. American culture has reversed Paul's great vision. What was Paul's great vision? To live his gain. Or to live his Christ, to die his gain. American culture says to live his gain, to die his Christ. Get all the stuff you can now, and then when you're dead, you get to go to heaven. What would it look like if Jesus rather than mammon was your Lord? If his vision for his kingdom was the thing you ran after? How would we walk with a good controversy in the world around us to paint a different picture of the gospel of Christ? Aristides to the Caesar Hadrian, one of the Christian apologists, said this, commentating on the Christian community. They love one another, and he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. 
And when they see a stranger, they take him into their own homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. And if there's among them any that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. And such, O king, is their manner of life. And verily, this is a new people, and there is something divine in the midst of them. And it's just, I think, our heart that one day city councilmen will be sitting together or the mayor will be gathering a panel of people to try and discern what is happening with this alternative economy springing up in the city. And they would say, such, mayor, is their manner of life. And verily, this is a new people the city has rarely seen. And there's something divine in the midst of them. We must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. And as we do that as a community on mission together, I believe that God will remove the spirit of mammon, release a spirit of blessing, and we will have a chance to manifest his love and his resources to those who need it most. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart to form us, to love us, to grow us, and to bless us. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, you would fill us with your truth and your vision about what it means to store up treasure in heaven. Lord, you desire for us to allocate wealth in the right place, long-term, long plays, the compound interest of eternity. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus, just reveal to us there's places in our hearts where our imagination has been seduced by this vision of mammon. And I just pray that you help us to dream the dream of Jesus for the world. And that you show each of us where we are, who you've made us to be, with the gifts, skills, talents we have. And every place that you've called us to be, what it looks like to live radically differently, to bear witness to the joy of your kingdom. So we offer our hearts to you, our minds to you, our lives to you, our resources to you and pray that you will help us to rightly order it for your glory, our enjoyment, and the good of the world. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as we close.